slashers, huh? What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> um, not that one. <laughs> And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking, we'll begin with a reign of terror, a few murders here and there. We're talking, it's cold outside when you have to go about naked. And we're talking, excuse me, sir, there's breathing in my barn. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking, here we go gathering nuts in May, nuts in May, <laughs> nuts in May. Here we go gathering nuts the in May glee. on a cold and frosty morning. <laughs> <laughs> the absolute glee that this character has of wearing a shirt, only a shirt, and chasing a woman down the street. It is maniacal, and I love it. Yes. Everyone, we are discussing James Whale's uh, 1933 classic, The Invisible Man, sandwiched right there in between Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> Oh boy, this was a first time watch and <gasps> you had kind of prepared me for this a little bit. You said it's very fun, it's very brisk, it's very deadly, and mm -hmm. I still felt like I was not at all prepared. Right? Because I feel like, you know, when we talk about all these older films, and y'all, we have episodes on Bride of Frankenstein, The Old Dark mm -hmm. House, Dracula's Daughter, many, many, yep. many others. But I feel like none of them get this demented. Because everyone, in case you didn't know, the Invisible Man is a psychopath. And it's mm -hmm. basically watching him kill people for 70 minutes. Yeah. And there's a very tangential explanation for why he's acting the way he is. I don't buy it at all. I think that this person is just like straight up fucking with people. Like he was looking for an excuse to just mess with people and possibly escalate to murder. I swear to God, half of Claude Rain's like lines of dialogue are just him mm -hmm. laughing. And oh, mm -hmm. I don't pr find this movie particularly scary. Except no. I will say this: I I think that his laughter is very scary, and you you might find this amusing. What it reminds me of is the laughter of oh my God, what's his name? The killer in My Bloody Valentine when he runs away into oh. the uh, into the mine. Mm -hmm. Axel, mm -hmm. I think. Um, it, it reminds me of that, and like that to me is a very, very scary ending for that movie. And so every time Claude Rains laughs in this film, I get like a little shiver up my spine. It's so chilling. And to think that this is his first talkie and his second feature. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll get into this in my <laughs> lengthy production history, but um, no one wanted him for this role. <laughs> Wild, which is like, I mean, he's basically just doing a vocal performance except for one scene. If you're not sold on his voice, maybe I could understand. But also, this voice is carrying this movie. It's so good, right? And the voice so is what got him hired. But like, when it was, oh, he's just a nobody. Like, he has no mm -hmm. credits to his name. Why would we cast him when we could potentially have Boris Karloff in the role? Oh, my God. I mean, I love me some Karloff, but also the man was everywhere at this time. Mm -hmm. This man from the UK is obviously very talented. Very much so. And again, he is evil. And everyone, just in case you didn't know, this fun fact that is everywhere is he is the deadliest of the Universal Monsters with the highest mm -hmm. body count. I believe we're clocking in at 122 people killed in this movie. If I'm not mistaken, this is higher than Ghostface, Freddy Krueger, yeah. <laughs> Chucky. Like, this is maybe only in contention with a Michael Myers or maybe a Jason Voorhees. I was going to say, I think he's got Michael Myers beat, but maybe Jason maybe. Voorhees. Yes, and obviously I'm recognizing those are not universal monsters, but just sure. for comparison's sake, because we always do those, you know, uh, graphic infographics. Where it's like, how many murders for serial killer? Right. This dude racks them up in the space of a weekend. Well, and that's why I like this movie so much is because it's, I mean, yes, he's a metaphorical monster, but he's mm -hmm. also the one human in these, like, uh, universal monster movies. Right. Yeah. He's the worst, and he's the most human. I'm, I'm excited to talk about, you know, if, like, how much we think that the, the serum actually turned him mad or oh. how much of that was already in his brain. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> obviously the water. But as I said, I have a lot of production here because um, holy moly, there's a lot of shit about this movie. A lot of drama. Sure. Drama and technical shit. Oh, yes, which actually I, I was expecting a lot more. It's a relatively easy explanation that I imagine was difficult to find when they were actually hmm. making this film. Okay, interesting. But tell me all about it. Yeah, so I, uh, everyone, I am pulling most of this information from a 35-minute featurette on the film's Blu-ray called Now You See Him, The Invisible Man Revealed. And it mm. looks like a lot of these interviews were done in the 90s. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, um, okay, so following the success of Dracula in 1931, screenwriters Richard L. Scheer and Robert Flory suggested to Universal Pictures as early as that year that they should adapt H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man. Both Carl Lamley and Carl Lamley Jr. opted to make a film adaptation of Frankenstein instead, which both Scheer and Flory did uncredited rewrites on. But oh, while Frankenstein okay. was shooting, Universal got sneaky, and they bought the rights to The Invisible Man from Wells in September of that year for a mere, well, maybe not back then, but for $10,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh, no, I think that would be big money back then. Yeah, probably so. I mean, it would, yeah, you know, use an inflation calculator, everyone. <laughs> Ooh, you keep going, I'll look it up. Okay. Now, one of Wells' novels, The Island of Dr. Moreau, had just been produced as a film by Paramount under the title The Island of Lost Souls. Now, legend has it that Wells was not pleased with the results of this film, which took his social satire and turned it into, quote-unquote, just a horror movie. Ugh, when it God, came Wells, <laughs> come on, man. I know. Also, interrupting, uh, so $10,000 in 1933 money is... Two hundred and thirty-eight, seven hundred and twelve dollars nowadays. Jeez! All right, so round it up: two hundred, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We're just gonna say that quarter of a million. That's dollars. a lot. That is a bestseller price. Like, yeah, yeah. That is the Stephen King of his day. Well, so when it comes to the Invisible Man, though, Wells insisted that Universal treat his work a little more respectfully and demanded script approval when he sold those rights. So, okay. good for him. Mm hmm. Now, even though the studio had trumpeted the fact that they had secured the prestigious rights to Wells' classic novel, that was all they were really interested in, which was the title of the book and the name of the author for publicity oh, reasons. <laughs> I mean, we've done this before, so it's not that surprising, but it's always a little bit galling. You know, you don't even care about what the actual content is. You want my name, you want the title. Yeah, which again, it's like, okay, well, but... You you just agreed to give him script approval for this, so you know you have mm -hmm. to follow the story. Unless, because Joe, I'll tell you, there's many, many, many drafts of this screenplay. And sure. I wonder if they were just like, you know what? We'll just change it up. Maybe he'll like one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's throw everything at it, and he'll pick one eventually. That's kind of what happened. Um, oh, no. But nevertheless, okay, so before we even get there, though. So in 1931, a novel was published called The Murderer Invisible by Philip Wiley. And this was a much more hard-hitting, dramatic story about a man who was out for power and seeks to get it through invisibility. And it was this man who, in this story, came up with an idea of an invisible octopus. Oh, <laughs> Oh. Okay. <laughs> and legions of invisible rats from New Jersey to spread the invisible bubonic plague in Midtown Manhattan. Mm hmm. Okay. This is, I mean, honestly, that sounds very interesting. Just not at all what I was expecting. <laughs> well, I'm also thinking, I mean, like, look, we'll talk about the effects for this movie, but how the fuck are you going to add in an invisible octopus and an invisible legion of rats? Mm hmm. On these special effects with this budget? Unlikely. Yeah, and, you know, this novel was missing uh, what some would say is the delicate touch that H.G. Wells had. But Universal bought the rights to that novel, too, um, and elements from the story wormed their way into the final version that we have today, um, mainly the emphasis on Griffin's megalomania. Right, which honestly is a huge selling factor in this film. I Honestly, I think that's what helps it stand out for some of the other films. You know, I, I'm actually not the biggest fan of Lugosi's Dracula. I like Lugosi uh, as Dracula, but I don't think the okay. movie is that great <laughs> right i will confess i don't actually know that i've seen it apart from you know clips of him doing the infamous cape swish and so on yeah i mean and you know there's obviously it's a very influential film but it's not my mm -hmm. favorite of these universal monster films right a little bit more straightforward than some of the juicy queer stuff that we usually talk about well and again something about the invisible man just feels taboo for 1933 Oh, you mean dick out? Yeah. <laughs> there's, lot, there's lots of stuff in this movie, which I think a lot of that's courtesy of Whale and his dark sense of humor, but we'll get there. I think so. Yeah. But we have to backtrack a bit, though, because the film version of The Invisible Man had its creative roots forged in a partnership by James Whale. And again, everyone, please go listen to our episodes on The Old Dark House or Bride of Frankenstein. I, I think mm -hmm. we do a pretty good primer on him in The Old Dark House, because that was the first one of his films. That was covered. the first one. Yeah. Yeah. 
But anyway, R.C. Sheriff, he's a screenwriter. He was the author of Journey's End, the play that brought James Whale to prominence because Whale had been an actor, occasional director, and set designer in the 1920s. And when he read Sheriff's play Journey's End, which was about trench warfare in World War I, he was determined to put it on. So this led to him making a film version of it in Hollywood, then getting a contract to being a director at Universal Studios. And then he was given the once-in-a-lifetime assignment that made him one of the hottest directors in town which mm. was 1931's frankenstein right yeah a classic yep so um, frankenstein made it clear that monster pictures were here to stay because dracula was a surprise hit for them so they tested the waters again with frankenstein which was a huge hit and mm -hmm. that film set in motion one of universal's most lucrative and enduring franchises the horror movie <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> We're just calling the horror genre a franchise. <laughs> oh boy. But also, this is why it's so delightful to cover older films, right? Because in some ways, we are going back nearly to the beginning of cinema, right? Yeah. Like 1933, ooh, that's like 15 years off of when we were like really starting to get into motion picture business. Exactly. So it's all, and it's interesting reading some of the interviews with some of the cast and crew, specifically Gloria Stewart about this film, because Gloria Stewart talks about how it was like Universal was kind of a shambles ramshack place. It wasn't very well organized. And so it's kind of a surprise that any of these films made it out as well as they did. Right. Okay. But Whale was given a free hand by Universal's head of production, again, Carl Lamley Jr., to develop a new project. And in his words, the spookier, the better. <laughs> it was here that Whale chose the old dark house. And unlike Frankenstein, Whale was involved in every aspect of that film's preparation and tailored several roles for his British stage colleagues, like Charles Lawton. Right, which is also why it's the queerest of all of the films. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of queerness. A lot of comedy in that, too. I mean, yeah, that, that, yes. that is a pivotal horror comedy, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think, as you've alluded to, it's very much in the style and the sense of humor, the way that Whale approaches things. Like, to me, that's the quintessential Whale text. And, you know, we'll see it in Bride of Frankenstein where, you know, there's a lot of camp to it. But I would argue there's more gleeful dark humor in this movie mm -hmm. which is why it stands out so much for me agreed yeah but whale was eager to bring rc sheriff to hollywood for a screen adaptation of the road back which was based on the best-selling sequel to all is quiet on the western front which had been one of oh. universal's most prestigious productions of 1930 oh okay but the studio said no we want more monsters and they decided <laughs> sure <laughs> They wanted Whale to direct a sequel to Frankenstein, but Whale didn't want to direct a sequel to Frankenstein. Um, he didn't mm -hmm. want to do a sequel to anything. So no. <laughs> he pinned his hopes on The Invisible Man uh, as a possibility to lure Universal's interest away from the sequel to Frankenstein and into another, albeit different, fantasy horror film. Okay. Yeah, if you can't get out of the monster game entirely, take a sidestep. Yeah. And so he all right, so here's where some of the drama starts, because following the release of Frankenstein, which again broke box office records, Universal had that film star, Boris Karloff, signed to a five year contract. And so okay, bear with me, Joe, because we're going to go through some dates here, but I just limited it to month and year. <laughs> OK. In December of 1931, the Los Angeles record stated that Karloff's next film would be The Invisible Man. And by the next month, January of 1932, Whale had already left the project, wary of being tagged as a horror director. And so this left Karloff as the only cast member of a film with neither a script nor a director. Right. Okay. Now we are entering a frustrating period of what we now call development hell. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, okay, so most of this I did gather from the film's Wikipedia page. However, all the footnotes for this credit it to one single source. And this is oh. historian Gregory Mank's production background of The Invisible Man, which was released in paperback and Kindle editions along with Sheriff's screenplay, final screenplay for the film. Oh, okay. So fairly reputable. Yes, yes. But again, you know, translation moving from the actual source to someone putting it on Wikipedia – I did my best to check my sources here, so hopefully this is okay. all accurate. But <laughs> <laughs> Don't come for Trace, that's what we're saying. Don't come for me. Uh, but you know, it's only this, per this, this development hell part, but Universal seemed to offer the screenwriting gig to every single writer in their stable, looking 
everywhere except mm-hmm. at hg wells original story <laughs> <laughs> look we said we bought it he got paid we just don't want to use his story well and it seems like they forgot he had script approval like maybe they were spending so much time trying to find someone to write this script that they were like oh right we have to get him to say yes before we can even do anything with it you know what afterthought gotta get that script out first and maybe it's because it wasn't common for authors to have script approval i don't i i don't uh, know i don't know yeah the first director set to replace Whale was one Robert Flory, whose film, The Adaptation of Murders in the Rue Morgue, was released in February of 1932. By April of that year, Flory had a draft of The Invisible Man, co-written with Garrett Fort, who had contributed to the scripts of both Dracula and Frankenstein, and later, Dracula's Daughter, which, hmm. I can't remember if we discussed this in Dracula's Daughter, but James Whale was supposed to direct that film, and he didn't want to. I think we briefly touched on it. Mm-hmm. But... Flory's script was based mostly on Wiley's The Murderer Invisible, not Wells's The Invisible Man. (laughs) Right. Oh, my God. That outline included plot elements such as an invisible octopus, invisible rats, and blowing up Grand Central Station. Stop it. Stop it with the octopus. (laughs) Stop it with the rats. So, unwilling to wait while Flory worked out the script and the film's technical difficulties, this is when Universal gave James Whale the go-ahead to make The Old Dark House, which would come out later in 1932. Okay. And this was also Boris Karloff's next feature with Whale, because remember, he played the malevolent butler in that film. Right. Yes. Whale had decided to return to horror features following the financial failure of his 1932 film, The Impatient Mate. So he's back to horror, but he's not doing The Invisible Man because he's like, fuck it, I can't do that. Mm hmm. By June of 1932. So we're in the summer now. Producer Sam Bischoff left Universal to set up his own independent studio, and he took Flory with him, so his screenplay went out the window when he left Universal. Right, yes. Okay. John L. Balderston, whose name had appeared in the credits of Dracula and Frankenstein, also submitted a screenplay for The Invisible Man in collaboration with the film's new director, who was a man named Cyril Gardner. This was Balderson's third attempt at the script, based primarily on, again, Wiley's novel, not Wells' novel. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) In mid-1932, so around this exact same time, Universal writers John Huston of, you know, Huston fame. Yeah. And studio scenario editor Richard Scheer attempted new treatments for the film. So by July 18th, there was still no officially approved script. And by this point, Universal had loaned Boris Karloff to MGM to shoot The Mask of Fu Manchu for 1932. Oh boy. Okay, we're not going to touch that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I imagine that's real not problematic today. Sure, definitely not racist. Yeah. So by November of 1932, following the release of The Old Dark House, Whale was again set to be the director of The Invisible Man, with a new script being written by a man named Preston Sturges. Uh, Oh my god. (laughs) (laughs) I know. You're You're so cavalier, I'm just like, oh my god, Preston Sturges? What? Uh Yes. Now, Sturge's script, get this, Joe, involved a Russian chemist who makes a madman invisible to wreak Mm -hmm. vengeance on Bolsheviks who have destroyed his family. Oh, my God. You know, (laughs) that's actually ahead of its time. Like, that's about 10 years too early. We absolutely would have made that movie in the 40s. 100%. So after working on the script for eight weeks, Sturge has handed in his screenplay and, here's the kicker, Universal fired him the next day. (laughs) <laughs> this is great goodbye you're you're done so whale had also written his own treatment for the film which is described again by historian gregory mank as inspired by both the phantom of the opera and mm. dr jekyll and mr hyde um yes interjected with religious touches like those in his films frankenstein and the old dark house but wells rejected this draft because by this point they were like oh we, we have an idea we're gonna get this done and then someone was like oh fuck we got to get wells's approval <laughs> And he didn't approve it. And after this, Whale left the project again. Well, yeah, because now it's his script that they've rejected. Yeah, exactly. So that is 1932. Now we're going into 1933. (laughs) So in January of 33, Universal reported a loss of over $1 million from 1932 and planned to shut down for six to eight weeks after current productions had finished shooting. So... While Whale was directing 1933's The Kiss Before the Mirror, John Weld was assigned to write the film's script for The Invisible Man. But that didn't work out. I don't know why. But yet another new writer was attached to write the script by February of 1933. And that screenwriter was James Wales's friend, 
R.C. Sheriff, who he had been friends with, you know, ever since they did that play. Right. Okay. Sneaking our way back in. Get a friend to write it. Got it. Yep. And as soon as they approved him, Whale was once again set to direct the film. And then, um, we cannot forget, y'all, Wells needs to approve this. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Sheriff did what they should have done from the beginning and started with Wells' novel and worked from there. Oh, my God. It's like, huh, what a light bulb moment. <laughs> I, I can't, like... Again, it's one of those things. It's like, what was Universal thinking? I mean, you know, studio tampering all the way back in 1932. Yeah, they they literally just said, we love this title and we do not <laughs> care about the content. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of like they wanted to make The Hollow Man to H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, right? Oh, my God. I was going to say, we've got to reference at least both of our Patreon episodes on the similar content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah everyone go listen to talk about hollow man for two hours because that movie is two hours long yes <sighs> uh also we do have another episode on the more contemporary version of the invisible man with elizabeth moss yes which is fan that's how you would like, readapt a that's story literally how you do it that's how you yeah. do it <laughs> mm-hmm. anyway so sheriff worked on the script at his home in london and disregarded universal's request that he draw material from wiley's the murder invisible and didn't look at the previous draft script because he was like no <laughs> right those are done they're in the past Yes. So the final screenplay restored Wells' plot. Oh, I'm also back into the documentary now, so I know for a fact all this is good. Okay. <laughs> the final screenplay restored Wells' plot with only a few concessions to Hollywood. So in the original story, Jack Griffin is not a mad scientist. Um, he speaks like a political revolutionary, which is not surprising because H.G. Wells was a devout socialist. Hmm. He, uh, Griffin wants to tear down the existing social order because he's so totally alienated from it by his invisible state. So he's not an unreasonable man, but he is caught in an unreasonable situation. Another change included having Griffin's drug monocaine not just make him invisible, but also drive him to insanity. Right. In the book, Kemp lives, but Whale and Sheriff wanted to give him a darkly comedic send-off, which, um, right. succeeded. I love it. It's so good. Uh, he also added a fiance for the Invisible Man. So he no. cast <laughs> Gloria Stewart, who he had just worked with in the old dark house. And you know what? She is lovely. She's overacting to the gills. But also, this is a character this movie does not need. She does not need to be in this movie. But I think I think that's going to play a part in our queer reading, Joe. I think so, too. Yeah. But anyway, so Sheriff completed his draft in June of 1933. And so, okay, getting in the home stretch. Mm -hmm. In this documentary, historians point out that the Invisible Man both reflected and revisited the story and structure of James Wales' film Frankenstein. Because in both films, you have the scientist who has disappeared to conduct his experiments in secret. Uh, you have his fiance who's worried about him and wonders what's happened to him. Mm -hmm. You have an individual who is friends with both scientists, but who loves the scientist's fiance. You can... Almost see Whale fixing the issues he had with Frankenstein because the studio tampered with that. For example, they made him tack on a happy ending in which Henry mm -hmm. Frankenstein survived. So Whale was determined in The Invisible Man to kill off both the scientist and the rival for the heroine. So this time the heroine gets nobody by the time the credits roll. Right. Presumably she just goes out and marries some other guy. <laughs> Um, so while Sheriff was completing that script, uh, several trade papers announced in June of 33. So, I mean, Sheriff finished the script by the end of June. But while this is happening, reports were saying that Karloff was leaving the film. Because, again, at this point, Karloff is still presumably involved. Um, right. The Hollywood Reporter said he was, quote unquote, definitely out. While Variety said he left because of salary issues. Ooh. I don't know if there's a definitive answer for this. But nevertheless, he is clearly not in the film. No. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> Uh, Whale's first choice to replace Karloff was going to be Colin Clive, who plays Dr. Frankenstein in Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Clive wanted, he turned it down because he wanted to take a vacation back home in England. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. It, hey, y'all, this is a job for people. Mm -hmm. People deserve their vacations. Enter Claude Rains, who was not the first choice of the studio or James Whale because he was a largely unknown English actor. He also had a very, very strong Cockney accent, and he came oh. from a very poor segment of the UK. Um, and, and a lot of his um, siblings died as babies from the poverty they had. Yikers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he reinvented himself on the London stage, much like James Whale, but... He had gone to Hollywood and done one disastrous screen test. So his career was pretty much going to be finished in Hollywood. But mm -hmm. once Whale heard his voice, he knew 
That's the Invisible Man. So wild. <laughs> this make or break opportunity. And I mean, again, he would go off and you know become a very famous actor. I mean, Casablanca mm-hmm. ain't nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Principal photography on the film began at the end of June of 33. So again, I think as soon as Sheriff finished the script, they were like, cool, behind the camera. Yeah, we've been working on this for a year. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Uh, they concluded filming in late August, but the special effects work took an extra two months to complete. Whale worked closely with special effects maestro John P. Fulton, who would later win an Oscar for parting the Red Sea in 1956's The Ten Commandments. Oh. Any portion of Claude Rains that was supposed to disappear was covered in black velvet, then photographed against a black velvet backdrop. And when combined with a separate shot of a normal set, the illusion of invisibility was startling. And y'all, I mean, Weird. even watching this movie today, I think it's mm-hmm. like, oh, so it many, holds how up. did they do that? Yeah, no, it, it looks so good still. You know, if you're going to compare it to the Elizabeth Moss version, obviously not as good, but mm-hmm. it's not even in the same kind of ballpark where I'm looking at this and just thinking, how do you do this without CGI? Well, and they, this is the, the days before green screens either. So it, mm-hmm. it's all about this compositing work. And Fulton's had the most difficult shot in the film. And I'll go into more detail for some of the more specific moments. But for this specific one, the most difficult shot in the film is when uh, Claude Rains is seated in front of a mirror looking at his own reflection as he unwraps oh. bandages on his head. Yeah. This required the filming of four separate pieces of film and later combining them together because you need to film the back of the Invisible Man, then Mm -hmm. the room that he's seated in. And for the reflection, you need to film the wall that's in the reflection. And separately, you need to film the front of the Invisible Man as he unwraps himself, which is the reflection, and then combine them all, all the film on top of each other. Holy cow. Okay. So all in all, approximately 4,000 feet of film received individual handwork treatment in some degree, making approximately 63,000 frames, which were individually retouched in this manner. Jesus, that's like, basically, they made an animated film. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the only time I've gotten this stressed reading about production like this is during Sleeping Beauty, <laughs> which is unrelated, but Sleeping Beauty has similarly troubled production. And again, mm-hmm. like just all the art in it. But um, the film's final cost after Fulton finished the special effects was around $328,000.33, which Oof. would be about $8 million today. Okay. You know what? We made a Blumhouse movie. I was so Joe. I was going to ask you. Guess what the budget was for Lee Winnell's The Invisible Man? Oh, I should know this because obviously we covered it. Um, if I remember, it was like twenty, wasn't it? Seven million dollars. No, I no, I could, I couldn't believe yes. it. So, uh, <laughs> but basically, both Invisible Man films roughly spent the same amount of money. That is wild. <laughs> it, it's honestly just like, what does your dollar get you in different eras? I, but yeah, seven million dollars for a film that relies that much on CGI for the invisible part. Like, it's, it's a little surprising, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Magic. So anyway, uh, following an October 26 press screening, uh, the Invisible Man was screened on October 31st, 1933. So Halloween night. This is weird. At the Kiva Theater in Greeley, Colorado, which is about an hour and oh. a half north of Denver. <laughs> <laughs> sure as you do colorado represent <laughs> who knows but um universal proceeded to roll it out theatrically over the course of november overall though it was described as a big success at the box office but the total gross of the film is unknown to this day mm, yeah box office reporting is really spotty well it's also a thing you know because i I won't go too deep in the reception, although needless to say, like, it's a very well-regarded film. You know, it's a sure. classic today, 94% yeah. of Rotten Tomatoes, um, Letterboxd users have it a 7.8 out of 10. But, like, it's weird reading the reception because they go city by city where it's like, oh, it didn't oh. do well in L.A., but it did do well in New York. But it's, like, specific mm-hmm. theaters. So I was like, well, did this screen anywhere that wasn't, like, New York or L.A.? <laughs> right. Or were those the only box office that were reporting back? Exactly. So And, and that may very well be the case because, I mean, again, like box office tracking wasn't amazing back then, at least yeah. not for a per theater average like that. No. Yeah. We we just did it differently. Yeah. But um, nevertheless, uh, th- that that's how it came to be, Joe. So why don't we talk about what happens in this movie? 
Okay, so I've got a couple of different sources for this one. So okay. as always, going to draw on Harry M. Benshoff's Monsters in the Closet, but only for like a smallish reference. So I am going to draw a little more heavily on Eric Langberg's director James Whale draws us in and then makes us root against the Invisible Man for mm-hmm. medium as well as an academic piece by David Lubagowski called Queering the New Deal, Lesbian and Gay Representation and the Depression-Era Cultural Politics of Hollywood's Production Code. And since since my academic credentials have run out, I only have a single paragraph quote from that. I was not able to actually access the article. Oh, now you're one of the plebs, Joe. I am, and it sucks because... (laughs) How am I supposed to sound smart now? That's how you were pulling all those things. Oh, I, I should have known. I, I always was like, where are you finding this shit? But that makes total sense. Yeah, it's called Behind the Firewall. <laughs> 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 okay, so let's talk about the movie. So we open with a gauze covered Jack Griffin, who is technically played by Claude Rains. <laughs> And he is walking through the snow to the Lion's Head pub in Iping. So inside this bar, we see crowds. They are cracking dirty jokes. So right off the bat, I'm thinking this has to be partially attributable to Wales's sensibilities, comedic or otherwise. Yeah, and you know, I, I couldn't find out if R.C. Sheriff, the, the other discriminator, was gay or not, but... Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of information about him, so I am going to choose to believe they might have had a thing going on. (laughs) When in doubt, just default assume. But I mean, if not, you have to assume that he would have a a similar sensibility to Wales. That's probably why they were friends. They probably got along in that regard. But, you know, like there's literally a joke in the first two minutes of this movie by some rando character in the bar who is essentially talking about this little boy named Willie. So he says, little Billy got sucked out of a pipe and i'm just like well this is gay this is gay right here <laughs> actually i'm sorry i found this too so um this is from a, a book review for um actually for sheriff's novel the hopkins manuscript but they say he was probably gay and probably an ephebophile which i had to look up oh. an ephebophile is an older adult who was sexually attracted to post-pubescent teenagers or adolescents usually in the oh, age range of no. 15 to 19 um no yeah so i'm not gonna touch that but um no. needless to say um he likely was gay Ooh, okay cool let's move on move immediately that. You know what? I'll I'll just move us on to the fact that we've got a coin-operated piano in this bar, which I loved. <laughs> what a weird touch. Not even the best part of this scene, because the best part of this scene is Una O'Connor as the oh barmaid Jenny. Jenny Hall. As soon as she showed up, I was just like, <laughs> I recognize this bitch, and I love her. But and that's because I think this is also why I like this film so much. Because she, she's in Bride of Frankenstein, and she's mm-hmm. basically playing a very similar character. Uh-huh. But she gets so much more to do in this film. But by yes. so much more to do, I mean scream hysterically. Oh, yes. There's <laughs> so, so much screaming. And it's never not funny. Every time she does it, I laugh. Every single thing. And apparently, so James Whale was actually more attracted to the kind of offbeat side characters than he was to his lead characters. And Sure. You could like, see He it. loved Una O'Connor. Like, she, yeah. he would not stop laughing every time he was filming her. God, that sounds delightful. But yeah, you you can see it. It reads on the film because, yeah, not only does she have so much more screen time, but she just gets to act the way she did at the end of Frankenstein and Mm -hmm. into Bride of Frankenstein. But that's her pitch the whole time she's on screen here. But it's got to be what? Quadruple the screen time? Oh, very much so. And I think that's why when we cover Bride of Frankenstein, I have mistakenly remembered her having, like, this role in that film. And so when I watched this again, I was like, oh, this is why I like her so much. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So, yes, uh, we've got the Invisible Man coming in, but he's he is clothed in a, a very heavy coat as well as a hat, a pair of sunglasses, and then his whole face is bandaged. But he strikes a very unique look so everyone is silent and stunned when he comes in so she has to take care of this so as the woman who is married to the bar owner she ends up offering him a room he wants a fire she takes him upstairs but every time she tries to engage him in conversation he's either very brusque or he doesn't respond to her at all so she's very put off by this behavior 
Yeah, very much so. And then, of course, downstairs, everyone else is just gossiping because it's a small town and we've got this random stranger who looks very unique. So they assume he must be a criminal. Are you a little surprised? Because, I mean, as you said before, we kind of hit the ground running with this movie. Like, he oh my is gosh. already invisible. So are you surprised? Not only do we not have, like, a, a prologue where we're mm-hmm. showing him turn invisible, we don't even get a flashback to that. No flashback, no opening scroll, no nothing like that. It's just, hey, he's invisible. Here he is. We have no idea what he's doing in Iping. We don't know what brought him here. Like, it is very much a, hey, the narrative has already started. You need to catch up. Which I appreciate to an extent, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah, I like it here. And then by the end of the film, I think, oh, okay, this movie is just too short. I mean, yeah, yeah, this is a 70 minute movie, one hour and 10 minutes long. And I, mm-hmm. how many times did we say I would have taken 15 more minutes, but I would have taken 15 more minutes. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I, I ended the movie thinking, oh, we just we needed at least 10 to 15 more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So Jenny ends up bringing his dinner to him and, you know, he says, I need peace and quiet. I don't want to be disturbed. So, of course, she forgets the mustard. She forgot the mustard, Trace. So she's got to bring it back upstairs. And, of course, she sees him taking off the bandage over his lower jaw. And there ain't no face there. It's like she caught him jacking off. It is. Honestly. So good. But yeah, and this is your first glimpse because you, you you as the audience, it's a split second shot. But you think she sees it and she doesn't. Mm-hmm. Well, I think she sees it, but she doesn't know entirely what she's seen. So she just attributes this to he's been in a terrible accident. Yeah, because she goes and tells him she's like, oh, he just got bandages everywhere. She doesn't mention he had no fucking face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, which you would think is what you would lead with if you saw this. But maybe it's a thing where it's like, if I say that, they're going to think I'm a crazy, hysterical woman. Um, So mm-hmm. I'm not going to do that. Well, and later on, when people do try to attribute everything to this invisible man, the first question is, how much have you been drinking? Yeah, yep, yep. Because we're at a pub, so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so yes, this is confronting. It's a little bit odd. And then we fade to black so we can introduce some new characters in a completely different location that I could not figure out where we were. And that's okay. It's fine. Um... (laughs) You just have to roll with it, so. Yeah. So we're introduced to Flora, who is Gloria Stewart, and she confronts her father, Dr. Henry Cranley, who is played by Henry Travers, and she wants to know what has happened to Jack. Where has he been? He's been gone for a whole month now. Yep, but he did say, I'll be gone for some time. Don't worry about me. And she is already breaking that rule. Yeah, so we're left to deduce by her reaction that she is romantically entangled with Jack. Her father seems nonplussed. You know, we learn eventually that Jack worked for him. But yeah, Jack was kind of off doing his own thing. So we just let him be, you know, he said he'd be back. So he'll be back. Don't worry about it. So, okay, first question of the bat. So we know that Floor is an invention of Sheriff Screenplay. Mm -hmm. Why do we think they added this? Unless it's going back to the whole, like, oh, yeah, we wanted to, like, fix what was wrong with Frankenstein, so we need to add in a love interest. But I I feel like it has to go beyond that. So we both mentioned off the top that we think this is going to contribute to our queer reading. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't have a woman immediately, the censors are going to look at this movie and say, hmm, this is a big old sausage fest. Where is a love interest? Where is some feminine energy to sort of dispel the queerness, the queer notions that's permeating this movie? So who's a more useless character, Flora in this movie or Gladys Mm -hmm. in The Picture of Dorian Gray? Uh, I would definitely say Flora because I honestly don't know what she does in this movie. I know. (laughs) Like, you and Amanda both had big problems with Gladys. I didn't actually mind her that much. It's just that she wasn't the most interesting woman in the portrait of Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. Whereas Flora, when you said, oh, yeah, she's an invention for this film, I thought, yeah, I can tell because here's a character who is on screen but doesn't serve a purpose. None whatsoever. I mean, like, I think we're supposed to care that she is so worried about Jack, but sure. I, and I do wonder if that's an issue with not seeing Jack pre-insanity. Mm. Like, because right. we haven't seen that, we're just taking her word for it, which I mean, I'm sure he was a great man, but... <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I know. But, but, but we're supposed to feel for her. And while Gloria Stewart is doing what she can, sure. it's a nothing role. 
No, it's a nothing role. She can only do so much. And I will say that when she is on screen, particularly in these early scenes, you know, we're used to hearing about how movies are not shot sequentially. So I'm not going to default assume that these scenes with her father or when she's speaking to Dr. Kemp are the first ones she shot. But her acting is so melodramatic and over the top. It feels like, okay, is this a first take? Are you not used to who this character is? Because, like, especially when Dr. Kemp says, oh, I was going to confess my love to you, and then she just bursts out crying, and she's throwing herself on these throw pillows. Uh. It feels like Whale is making fun of her because we just hold on it as she basically has a crying temper tantrum. And I mean, <laughs> I'm just like, well, what are we doing right now? That, but that, that's reading into my query because this to me is a gay man like mocking heteronormativity by doing this. I mean, unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's a woman who's the butt of all this, who's getting the, all this shit. But it's also almost like maybe Gloria Stewart thought she was still on the set of the old Dark House. Hmm, maybe. Yeah, this is know. quite a bit bigger than any other performance in this movie. It mm-hmm. would have fit right in with that film, but not so much this one. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, Claude Rains is doing all the overacting in this movie in a good way, but like. Sure, yeah. <laughs> And and his is mostly vocal performance, so it's almost easier to deal with. I don't know, man. When that shirt is jumping around the policeman in the room, <laughs> it's... <laughs> I, I have thoughts about that particular scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yes, uh, Flora is very concerned. Her father is not. And then this is where Dr. Arthur Kemp, who is played by William Harrigan, comes in and... We're essentially dropping some exposition. So Jack had a secret lab. He was doing experiments. Why did he have a locked door? And also, hey, Flora, I'm secretly in love with you. And I think, I mean, outside of that, which who could care? These scenes operate primarily to catch us up with the story that we've missed so far. And I guess Mm -hmm. maybe it's a budget thing. Maybe that is it. Maybe they knew they would have to spend so much money on the effects for the film that they were like, well, we can't do this whole, like, how did he become invisible? We can't film all of that. Yeah, because the closest thing that we get is, you know, what Jenny calls a chemist set in his room in Iping. Yeah. But, like, we don't actually see him turn himself invisible at any point. Like, the closest thing we get is the reveal at the end of the film when he finally comes back to human form as he dies. (laughs) And I feel like that's something we wanted to keep special for the conclusion. Oh, you know what? I like that, yeah, because that's right. We don't know what he looks like until the very, 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 very last shot of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Honestly, I I looked at it and I was like, I think I've been watching too much Drag Race, but this feels like a reveal yourself moment. It really does. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we're about to get the invisibility reveal, so. This is true. Yeah. Um, Before we move on, so this Uh is my one and only reference to Benchoff. He doesn't have a ton to say about this because he's primarily focusing on the old dark house when he's talking about James Whale. Mm -hmm. But I did love this trace because we're talking about flowers. So (laughs) Benchoff says, flowers and things horticultural were also a coded signifier for male homosexuality. So in The Invisible Man... James Whale's mise-en-scene prominently forces seemingly incongruous flowers into a scene wherein the Invisible One's friends wonder about his disappearance. So it's like, where is he? I don't know. But hey, he's a little bit fey because look at all these flowers. (laughs) I don't think I knew that. Like, I didn't know that either. It seems like such a reach. But then part of me is like, well, no, we've talked about secret codes and ways of visually communicating things. So it's like, if you know, you know, oh, why have you got the flower? Why are you a horticulturist? Why are you so <laughs> interested in gardening? You a big moat. Is he, you know, um, <laughs> a florist? <laughs> there is he a florist. There, there has to, I'm sure this exists. Maybe we talked about it before. Is, is there an encyclopedia of like, down low gay code like be it verbal visual like the flowers or whatever like this has to Mm -hmm. exist right i feel like we have talked about this in a couple of different ways so obviously coded language and then of course we've talked about the hanky code a couple of times but yeah i mean honestly folks reach out horrorqueers at gmail.com let us know if particularly you are international listeners and you got interesting things that would be like oh if you saw this you would know or if you heard this you would know queer yeah exactly i'm fascinated by fascinating yeah Okay, so we return to Jack. He is experimenting in his room, trying to find what he calls 
a way back. So he's cracked a code on invisibility, but he doesn't have a serum to reverse the effects. So we've got a better sense of what he's doing here. Yeah, that, and that's always the problem. Where it's like, I mean, at least in Hollow Man, we see them testing on animals to figure it out mm-hmm. first. And, you know, Kevin Bacon's like, whatever, just do it. But right. in this one, it's like, well, yeah, man, like, d- <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> I mean, my real question is, how do you experiment on this when you can't even see your own fucking hand? A hundred percent. Actually, my favorite touch of this was later in the film when he's telling Kemp, mm-hmm. I have to hide after I eat food because it is visible in my belly until it digests. Yes. And he specifically says for up to an hour. So that's how you know he's a scientist because he's been clocking it. Okay, this is how long I have to stay hidden or else people will see me. But even there's a moment where he says, it took me a while to get used to going downstairs because you look at your feet when you walk down. And I thought, yes, yes, I do. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Checks out. Every time you walk downstairs, now you're going to be looking at your feet like, fuck, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. In case you're ever turn invisible. Uh, truly, yes. I need to practice now for the inevitable. <laughs> okay, so he's he's working on this, and this is when Jenny tries to come in, but he tells her he's busy, he's working on his experiments. So he ends up slamming the door on her, and she gets really fucking pissed off because she drops her tray full of food. She's unhappy. Oh, I mean, she's just screaming, 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 screaming. screaming. <laughs> 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 yep. So she goes downstairs to her husband, Herbert, who was played by Forrester Harvey, and she insists that he make Jack leave because we also learned that Jack has not been paying his bills. So he keeps saying, oh, there will be money coming soon. I swear I'm good for it. But they've actually been doing him a kindness by bringing him food, letting him stay here. And they don't have any kind of guarantee that he's actually going to pay the bills. So this rude behavior is the final straw. I was going to say, like, I kick him out, too. 100%. Yeah, you don't get free room and board just because you say, oh, I'm good for the money. I swear it's coming. Well, and as we've already said, he's a megalomaniac who thinks he can just rule the world. So this is just a blip in his timeline. Yeah, he he does not care about these little people. And he will say it repeatedly later in the film. Which, again, that seems like something that should go against the code. But I guess maybe Mm. it's because the film is like, no, this man is evil and he does die by the end of it. Yeah, just that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Herbert goes up and he tries to make Jack leave and Jack ends up throwing him down the stairs, which, of course, only makes Jenny more hysterical. So at this (laughs) point, now we're calling in the cops. Which, uh, yeah, and they they will be a prominent part for the entirety of the rest of this film because it's basically like what we have after this is just a constant manhunt. A constant manhunt, a couple of different police officers. So the first one we meet is Constable Jaffers. He's played by E.E. E. Clive, and he arrives, and this is where we get our first big reveal. So he goes in and he says, okay, like, I'm going to have to arrest you. I'm going to have to escort you out of here. And Jack just says, oh, okay, if you can catch me. So he removes the bandages, and lo and behold... He's invisible, baby, and we don't know where he is. So I feel like, I mean, I'm I'm interested to see what you thought of this as a first time watcher, but like, I feel like this happens so early in the film. Like, you don't think it's going to go off, not go off the rails, but like, he's just going to do this reveal and just go go off (laughs) Mm -hmm. right now. No, yeah. I mean, I guess you don't want to drag it out too long. And even though this does feel early, as you said earlier... It's a 70 minute movie, so we got a motor. But there's also like, it almost feels like a Three Stooges level of like physical comedy and Pratt Falls yes. here as he fucks with these cops, which I, again, I really appreciate it. I have to believe that's a whale touch. Yeah, it is wild. The mixture between the comedy and the threats, right? So Jaffer mm-hmm. says, okay, we're going to get rid of you. And Jack is saying things like, an invisible man can rule the world. He can hear every secret. He can rob and rape and kill. Oh, yeah. And I think he either starts that monologue with this or ends it with this. But he tells them, you know, you must be made to understand what I can do, which Mm -hmm. I love that. (laughs) It's so evil. (laughs) But at the same time, you're right. There's huge physical comedy because he strips down. I'm sorry. He's not fully naked at this point. He's still wearing a shirt. So what we see is this shirt dancing by itself as he does his little dance and all these kinds of things. Mm. So I'm going to bring in Langberg here. 
He says, even though Griffin is invisible, Whale still strategically places a table in front of where his crotch would be, just like you would if his junk was actually flopping around in the visible spectrum. (laughs) C, the strategically placed flower in front of the male nude in Will's apartment on Will and Grace, or the whole scene in The Simpsons where Bart skateboards in the buff. So Will is inviting us to imagine it, even if he isn't showing it. So this is very much like Whale fucking with the audience forcing us to imagine oh he's naked oh his dick is out i i mean i just thought about how cold he must have been for most of this movie because again it's oh, sure. in case we didn't like mention this it's snowing profusely throughout the entirety of this film mm-hmm. and i love that it's not just oh it's snowing and that makes it extra complicated it's like part of the plot yeah oh yeah it, it will play a very important part in the finale mm-hmm Okay, so shirts dancing around, we're dodging these cops, and then Jaffers and the others try to bar the door because, of course, they can't see him if he removes this shirt. All of a sudden, he'll just be gone, so they try to prevent him from leaving. The window opens, and Jaffer goes to check it out, thinking he must have jumped, Mm -hmm. and instead, Jack strangles him, beats the shit out of these other guys, and Mm -hmm. then unleashes chaos on the entire population of this town. I mean, he's running this town amok. It is wild, and he just kills willy-nilly. Yeah, so, but it it runs the spectrum, right? You know, he's grabbing an old man's hat and throwing it in the river. He picks up somebody's bicycle and rides it for a bit and then throws it into a crowd, but also nearly strangling a police officer to death. I mean, he also, I would argue, almost kills a baby. Maybe not right now. It's later in the film, but when he just knocks over a baby carriage just because. It is here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, again, he doesn't do anything. He just knocks it over and like, you know, that Mm -hmm. baby could die. It's like falling in the concrete in the snow. Sure, but also, what are you doing? Why are you fucking with people this way? Because. Because he can. Yes! That's why. Yes! And again, that's where I'm just like, this is fantastic. I wasn't expecting this level of diabolicalness. <laughs> diabolicalness? Mm-hmm. Sure. No, I mean, I, I feel like we're used to thinking of older films as a bit more sedate. They're a little bit right. more reserved, in part because they are being... I mean, I think I mentioned the code would come down on them. The production code is actually not in place at this point, so we were free to get away with more things. That's And I do wonder, again, if this movie was made later, if we would have tramped down on some of this. You can't knock over a baby. You can't suggest that this man is running around with his dick out. I, okay, so because there, there are several sequels to this film. Um, There's The Invisible Man Returns. There's mm-hmm. one called, like, The Invisible Agent, where it's, like... He's a spy. spy, There's the Invisible Woman. I will say the Invisible Man returns. Um, The person that plays the Invisible Man is one Vincent Price. But yes, that was, I believe, 1940. So that would have been during the code era, I think. Yes, you're right. So in the 40s, it obviously would have applied. Of course, uh, depending on where you get your information from, the code is either from around 1934 to 54. So this is literally just missing it. <laughs> Honestly, people probably saw this and was like, we got we can't have more movies like that coming out. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't have invisible men knocking over babies and derailing trains. Where's the decorum? I take the knocking over of the baby as a queer reading, too, because he's going against the nuclear family. (laughs) It's true. Infamously, queer people do knock over babies because we hate them. (laughs) That's the gay agenda right there. Can you imagine? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So we jump back to Dr. Cranley and Kemp. They are looking through Jack's lab to try to find out more information about where he might have gone from. They discover a list of ingredients, including the aforementioned monocane. And we learned that this is a drug made from a flower in India. So, okay. Xenophobia! (laughs) Yep, yep. We're very scared of foreign people. And uh, we learned that when you inject monocane under the skin, it will draw the color from everything it touches, but it will make the creature stark raving mad i know i want to like i feel so bad for that dog that they tested it on we don't we don't see it but we we hear about it right yeah okay so you said earlier do we think that he was mad before or do we think that this is the effect of the drug what do you think uh i mean everyone involved seems to think it is the drug itself but i Mm -hmm. just I don't know. I feel like whenever it's like, oh, yeah, someone turns mad. It's like, no, but they have a little mm. bit of that in them beforehand. The drug just amplifies it. 
that that's that's my thought process yeah in truth we don't have enough information to make a really smart argument on either side you could argue that flora seems like a nice girl and why would she fall for a man if he was a bit of a sadist like what we know of jack in this film so that could be an argument that yeah it really did turn him mad but he is so gleeful like this seems like he is finally able to open up this Uh id and just like live it yes i'm going to unleash everything that i've been repressing because now i can i'm invisible yeah he's coming out as a psychopath yeah he's coming out (laughs) okay so uh dr cranley and dr kemp make a pledge to each other they're only going to tell the police if they come and investigate they're only going to say that jack is missing not that he has been experimenting with this drug that turns you cray cray (laughs) yes good plan yeah so kemp goes home and he's listening to the radio this is where we're reporting on the delusion of iping where all of the residents are seemingly blaming an invisible man for their problems but uh you know the radio just gets turned off and invisible man jack finishes it up for him so yeah not so much a delusion yeah, and he's not right from the get-go he's like sit down you fool (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah If we're thinking queer reading, this to me is where it really starts to come in. Because sure, Jack makes the argument that he needs a visible person to help him as an accomplice, as an assistant, Mm -hmm. whatever. But the fact that he doesn't even make an effort to talk to his girlfriend, to talk to his former mentor, Dr. Cranley, like he goes to the only other bachelor well into his house ask for his pajamas it's coming up in a couple scenes after he like goes off the cops again but this is a specific line from uh jack where he tells kemp there's no need to be afraid kemp we're partners bosom mm-hmm. friends and i was like bosom uh-huh. friends how many men do you know that use that language um tom hanks when he's dressing up as a woman in that tv show bosom buddies yeah yeah <laughs> uh so yeah no i i I don't think it's as explicit as maybe something in the old dark house but like i think Mm -hmm. it's really easy to get a queer reading off of jack and kemp i think so yeah and even the point where you know jack has this push and pull violent snm relationship with kemp right where he Mm -hmm. says i need your help but also immediately upon entering this conversation he lifts up a fire poker like he's going to bean him and then he says i'm strong and i'll strangle you yeah yeah and well i mean kemp is clearly the sub in this relationship yeah yeah but even this idea that jack strangles men in this movie well i guess i actually kind of like that though because uh, let's say he had gone the other end he does go to his his girlfriend right now granted Mm -hmm. we'll see later that 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 flora's presence does soften him however yeah I at least because Flora is so useless in this movie, she's never a damsel in distress. Kemp no. is the damsel in distress. Yes, yes. He's the one who needs to be protected. But I feel like I didn't give the the right amount of gravity when I was introducing the idea that he strangles men. Oh, sorry. just because it's so intimate. And if you think about it, he's always doing it while he's naked. So you need to be in this super close proximity. Like the dankly bits are touching as yeah. I'm squeezing the life out of you. I mean, I was like, well, why doesn't he just pick something up and kill them? But I guess it's because yeah. if you pick something up, then you're giving yourself away. Well, there is that. And if we're thinking about other invisible people films, that is often the tell, right? They often give themselves away because they pick up a fire extinguisher or a poker or a gun or a knife. But he strangles in the nude um, several mm-hmm. people in this movie. Like, it's yes. not just a one and done no he seems to like it there's Mm -hmm. a sexual element to that Uh and whether you want to read that as inherently queer or gay specifically or if you just want to say it's kind of urging on a bit of a sexual fetish it really is and i think that's okay there's something about it that feels so icky to me that i'm like Mm -hmm. good for you james whale (laughs) honestly sneaking this in to people's random invisible man movie I do wonder, I mean, because again, he did this because he didn't want to do Bride of Frankenstein, but then what does he do after this but Bride of Frankenstein? So I just Mm -hmm. wonder if, like, like what got him back in the mood, you know? I wonder if he realized he can play with the expectations, he can subvert them in ways Mm -hmm. that will work for his type of filmmaking. Maybe so, honestly. I mean, again, y'all, go listen to that episode of Bride of Frankenstein, because it is a masterpiece for a reason. Oh my god, so good. So good. 
Okay, so, yes, uh, he asked for things like bandages, pajamas, sunglasses, and so on, so that he can make him more comfortable, because he recognizes, you'll feel better if you can see me, won't you? (laughs) So, left to his own devices, uh, Jack is quite happy to parade around entirely naked, free of the constraints that society might impose on him by asking him to cover up. He's no longer bound by what society expects or demands of him. And freed from those shackles, he's inherently destructive and violent. Which, do you have this line of dialogue with the Reign of Terror? No, you go for it. Oh my god, so he tells this man, We'll begin with a Reign of Terror, and a few murders here and there. Murders of great men, murders of little men. Just to show we make no distinction. (laughs) (laughs) equal opportunity murder that's what we're saying i appreciate it thank you jack griffin (laughs) for sure yeah he's a man of the people (laughs) Uh, okay so uh jack goes upstairs he locks the door because i i do feel like this would be the hardest part about being invisible i mean there'd be many hard parts as he said the weather would be a huge factor but just this idea of how vulnerable you would be when you're sleeping so the fact that he draws the blinds and locks the door immediately makes so much sense to me the one aspect of invisibility that they don't really incorporate here that i i mean again it'd be too much of a hindrance but is that um he has no eyelids so like right scientifically speaking vision would be impaired by being invisible (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah how do you get some shut eye when you literally can't shut your eyes yeah and i mean i think it's also something to do with the way your eyes process light and color so i think it would actually also distort your field of vision Ooh, interesting okay but but, um, nevertheless he does wear glasses in this movie but it's just to hide the fact that he's invisible yeah and I think also to make it a little bit easier for the special effects at the end of the day. Ooh, could we just have Claude Rains and some bandages and sunglasses? Because it's a little less work for us. Just, you know what? Fair. Just a little. Just a little. (laughs) Okay, so he is upstairs with Kemp before he goes to bed, before he locks the door. And he says, yeah, he's worked for five years and conducted a thousand experiments before the great, wonderful day that he cracked this invisibility formula. It's kind of wild, right? Like, we're continually reminded he is a madman, but he is a scientist. Like, he is approaching this with scientific rationale. Which I think makes it scarier. Mm -hmm. Because you would expect him, well, I was about to agree with you, but then I realized, oh, if he's looking at this as all part of an experiment that's going to further scientific progress yeah. then he doesn't care who's going to get hurt in the process no yeah we're, we're all lab rats to him but it, i i guess i just I'm, as for, from a genius to a dum-dum having this power um mm-hmm. i guess there's more chaos in a dum-dum having it right but like i'm not really worried about whatever grandmaster plan he has because a dum-dum is probably thinking about it like right now whereas sure. jack is planning very far ahead into world domination Hmm. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I definitely had some real world vibes coming from this where, you know, you get a taste of power, you go off uh-huh. the deep end. But also, you're right, there's something far scarier about someone who's smart and has huge mm-hmm. power compared to someone who's just stupid and is saying, Oh, okay, I'm gonna use this to spy on women like Kevin Bacon in Hollow Man, right? Right, right. Although, I'm well, I, I thought you were about to make a Trump comparison, which <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, (laughs) wink, wink. I was never super worried about Trump because he's a fucking idiot, but he did surround himself with people who had a lot of power who were smarter. Yes, exactly. So, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, one part of Jack's plan that has not come to fruition, though, is that he still doesn't have this antidote. It's what he was working on back in Iping. So, he needs to go back and get it, and that's part of the reason why he needs camp. So... We need to go and collect his notepads. So we do cut back. We see drunken locals are being interrogated by the police. And Kemp has to work with Jack so that he can sneak in. And I love this idea that everyone is in this room. And (laughs) Jack just opens the door, walks in. Nobody sees him. Nobody's paying attention. He goes up to his room. He grabs the notebooks and just drops them out the window. And Kemp grabs them on the way down. I do like these because, I mean, we talked about, you know, how they make him look invisible, but I love it when it's props. And Mm -hmm. they're clearly just being held by a string, but you don't see that string, which I was like, all right, good, good work, good work effects. 
yeah, it's fun to just watch things float around on screen. Which, this is kind of like the 30s version of like a movie that's, well, I don't want to say it's all effects first and like story and plot second, mm -hmm. but I do think the effects maybe overshadow the narrative of the film. Right, yeah, because too often it's look at what we can do and then yeah. after something exciting has happened, you think back and go, okay, so what do we gain from that? What does it do? Exactly. And that's why we have so many scenes of him disrupting like a group of people, be it in the pub, in mm -hmm. the police, whatever, in a barn, yeah. whatever, because we're just seeing a bunch of things move by themselves because we're showing off these effects. Yeah, it's very exciting. But yeah. also, oh, right. We're also supposed to be telling a story. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so that's exactly what happens here. You know, yeah, we've collected the notepads. We should be able to get this clean getaway because no one even noticed we were here. And yet Jack can't help himself. He has to bloat the candle in front of all these police officers and like freak people out. And you think, okay, you know, he's just being a showboat. He's just being an egomaniac. Mm -hmm. And then he bashes this police officer so hard in the face that he kills him. Yeah. Yeah, because he didn't like that they were calling the Invisible Man a hoax. He was personally offended by that. So yeah, he mm -hmm. strangles this guy, another strangling, and then you just bash him over the head with a wooden stool, killing him. Like, what? Him. What? Yeah. Just for fun! For just no for good fun. reason. No. <laughs> so of course, you've now killed a policeman. The news is going to spread. You also did this in front of a whole room of people, so the witnesses are multiplying. So uh, people know that this is now real. This is where Jack yeah, explains a little bit more about how the process works, about the food, about how he has to stay indoors when the weather is not clear. Because obviously, if it rains, you can see him. If it snows, you can see him. If there's even a mist or a fog, you'll be able to see the outline, which I love that the film just addresses this so that yeah. we can say... Okay, yeah, I expected that was going to play a, a factor, but it's smart to have the character acknowledge, oh, I've already figured that out. Uh, I also love that he basically tells Kim, he's like, oh, you also have to wipe my feet every hour. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want a visible accomplice or an assistant or even a friend. He wants a lab dog. He wants someone who's going to go and look after him. Mm -hmm. He wants a Renfield. Yes. <laughs> yes, he wants a Renfield. Okay, so he ends up like, cool, day's work done, he undresses, he goes to bed, and we jump back to Iping, and now the chief of detectives, who is played by Dudley Diggs, has come in. So we've escalated up a notch in terms of a social hierarchy, and we're organizing a search. So Jack is sleeping, and we see all of these residents, you know, being told, lock your doors, lock your windows. We see people at a dance as the radio announces that there's now a thousand pound reward for his capture. Yes, and I did look this up. This would have been about $200,000. Right. Like today. huge today, money. Today money, sorry. <laughs> big, big, big money. Yeah. So this is where Kemp calls Dr. Cranley because he says, you know, I'm freaking the fuck out. I've got this invisible man upstairs. I don't know what to do. And Dr. Cranley tells him to stay calm and stay quiet. Except, of course, Flora's been listening, so she knows that something's up. And Kemp ends up panicking. He ends up calling the police, as many other people have been doing, saying, oh, this is how you can capture an invisible man. But when Kemp calls in, he says, he's actually here. You need to come. And they say, oh, well, we're fielding so many calls. We're actually short staff. We can't send anybody right now. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, bum, bum, um, Kemp is, <laughs> this poor man, he is so afraid for the rest of this movie. <sighs> he's trying. Like, I appreciate that he is caught in the middle of a bad situation. He makes mostly rational decisions, you know, like he doesn't wait too long to call the police. He tries to give Jack what he needs so that he doesn't become suspicious. But yeah, it's just you can tell it's not going to be good for this character. No, but because it's an older movie, I don't think you expect what happens to him to happen. A hundred percent. No, I thought he was going to end up with Flora and they would be boring and have kids. Mm hmm. So speaking of Flora, she has heard her father. She knows what's up. So she says, I know Jack best. Let me go. Let me talk to him. So we go over to Kemp's house and she says, let me see him by myself. And it works for a little bit. I, I think, though, is this the only scene they share together? Mm, 
this is the only scene until the, until the end. Yeah. yeah. See, and that's the other, I, I guess, I mean, uh, like, would he have been, not cured, but would he be able to, res- like, restrain himself from murder and mayhem uh, had mm-hmm. Flora stayed around him for longer? Yeah, it's hard to know, again, because we just don't have that information, because they do seem reasonably good for each other. You know, he claims that he did this because he was poor, but then also he just goes on and on about how he's going to be super rich now because everybody's going to be throwing millions of dollars at him (laughs) because they're going to want to, you know, have an army of invisible men to walk the earth. And you just think, okay, we went from you doing this because you were poor for her Mm -hmm. to suddenly you making millions and global armies like dude (laughs) global armies (laughs) she's like uh you're a megalomaniac you honestly think that you are untouchable i mean i think it's at this point too he says even the moon's frightened of me frightened to death the whole Mm -hmm. world's frightened to death yeah And she says, you know, well, why don't you come back with me? My father can work with you in the lab. We'll figure this out. She's trying to say all the right things. And he says, hmm, your father sucks. Your father's a bad scientist. I'm not doing that. Well, and just at this point, he realizes that Kemp has betrayed him. So he's made his personal mission to kill him, but not just kill him. He fucks with him by saying, I'm going to kill you at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. Watch out. (laughs) He basically says, I'm giving you a 24-hour deadline the minute that he sees the police and the dogs starting to surround the house. It's just like, oh, you fucked up, and I'm going to get you in 24 hours. Set your watch. It's so sad. Because again, I mean, it's enough that he's killing all these people, but this is sadistic. Like, he is Mm -hmm. a madman who enjoys tormenting people mentally. Well, and he's making it so personal. I mean... yes. (laughs) Why doesn't he go after Dr. Cranley? Why doesn't he go after anybody else? And you realize, oh, he probably would, given the chance. It's just that Kemp is the person who's in his eye line right now. Yeah, I mean, but again, he he told Kemp, don't tell anyone, and boop, there's Flora. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he does end up making a fairly easy escape because these cops are fucking stupid. They're bad. They're very ineffectual. I mean, they they keep trying to do this, everybody hold hands, everybody form a ring, we're not going to let them by. But then, you know, somebody gets their nose pinch, and they have a conniption fit, and you just think, well, if he really wanted to, he would have just strolled right by. And instead, he's just picking these cops up by their feet, swinging them around. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, but this is, it looks like, um, like it, it looks like this is a person on a string, but it is great because it's, it's more of this like physical comedy of sorts. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it almost feels like an Abbott and Costello movie, which yes. they would meet the Invisible Man later, obviously, right. but not this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that I was thinking Keystone Cobb. So it's very, I mean, <laughs> James Whale saying a cab because these cops are fucking stupid, but it's 1933. <laughs> But then we also have Jenny back because she Jack now has a pair of pants that he's wearing and she he's just chasing her around. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it's so silly, so funny, but also kind of dire because we end this and then we go to the chief of detectives debriefing Flora and Dr. Cranley to try to get some insight into what's uh-huh. driving Jack and... You know, Kemp is rightfully saying, um, can someone offer me protection? I'm about to die. He threatened my <laughs> life tomorrow. And they treat him with such like, no, you're fine. Just go in the corner. You're OK. It's it's not contempt per se, but it's very much like a we don't care about you, man. Yeah, they treat him like a child. You know, yeah. we've got more serious adult things we need to deal with. Go play with your toys. But he is kind of infantilized in this movie, which I do. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, I'm not an expert in movies of the 30s, but I do feel like to show a man in that kind of a state isn't very common because men mm-hmm. aren't babies. Right. Yeah. What's well, also, I don't know, part of the reason that I think is really interesting that Jack does respond so strongly to Kemp, like, instead of pursuing Flora, kidnapping her, you know, taking her prisoner and doing something, which is like what you would expect if this was a Frankenstein movie. Right. He's hyper fixated on Kemp. And that to me is another symptom of the queerness, right? Like, I could go after the girl that I purportedly love, but really, I'm secretly in love with this man. And how I show it is, oh, well, I need to knock out the competition. Well, and I wonder why the betrayal isn't that he went to Flora and told Flora about him. It's that he has that extra relationship with Flora. And it's like, oh, I thought you were my lover. What, Mm -hmm. What are you doing with that? 
Yeah, I thought it was you and I doing this. I mm-hmm. thought we were going to be doing the groundbreaking science. Which is why Kemp's death is arguably the most cruel one of the film. Uh-huh, yeah. And it feels so pointless, but also uh-huh. it's kind of hilarious. I mean, it, I'll wait till we get to the scene because I love yeah. that scene, but yes. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's especially rough to see the police placate Kemp at this moment because we know that Jack is absolutely capable of murder and then we cut to the next day as he quite literally throws two people off a cliff uh, and then derails a train with what we're told has a hundred passengers on it. Yeah, so this is one of those ones where if we had a death counter on the film, you know, we'd have like a, like a maybe a double digit number, maybe a single yeah. digit number in the corner of the screen. But then this train goes down and it goes up by a hundred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is obviously miniatures, but it looks good it looks fun and this train just goes boom (laughs) do you remember if you can hear the screams of the people when it goes down oh gosh i can't remember i can't remember remember. we just we just hear the train whistle going i mean again we we do see the miniature go off the rail and go into the water but yeah i can't remember if we actually hear people screaming but um yeah this is i mean this is rough man he just intentionally kills all these people Yeah, no, it is rough, but I think you might be thinking of Kemp's death because we definitely hear him screaming when the car goes off. I know, I just feel like if you have a train of 100 people, you hear like a collective like, oh, as a train, but I I don't, I don't, I don't remember. (laughs) Yeah, they were sleeping. Maybe they were sleeping. They were eating in the dining car. Yeah, just that. They were having a lovely last meal and then it was over. (laughs) Okay, so this is a huge fucking deal now. We have derailed a train, killed triple digit people. So the chief of detectives is now talking to reporters. He makes a statement to them. He says, we have a hundred thousand men searching. Which... To which I said, sir, no, you don't. That is a bull face lie. <laughs> I don't even know if you have a thousand people in the town. No, no. <laughs> I I would be curious to see if you have a hundred because when we see the officer circle the barn at the end, I'm going to go out on a limb, say that's about 25 to 50 people. (laughs) That is not hundreds of thousands. No idea. No idea. But you know what? He's trying to make a make a good impression on everyone. Mm -hmm. So what he does not tell, well, he sort of tells, but also doesn't tell, is that we're basically using Kemp as bait because we have no idea where the invisible man is now. But we do have that ticking clock. So what we're going to do is we're going to sneak Kemp to the station. He's going to be surrounded by police officers, so we can't get to him. And then we're going to take him into the police station, and then we're going to feed him out through a secret door into a car. He'll drive in the mountains. He'll be gone. But we're going to lay a trap with, like, dirt on top of the police wall, and we've got (laughs) uh, lights and also some, like, paint and stuff that we're going to use. And this plan is foolproof. Unless the Invisible Man is already there listening to you. Yes, unless that or unless a cat happens to walk by like these people are so fucking stupid. It just goes to shit immediately. Well, you know, they haven't seen enough movies about invisible men to think about all the ways this could go wrong. (laughs) Truly. Yeah, the, the idea that they never consider. I mean, they do try to clear the room when they're taking Kemp out. So they have all the guys stand in the center of the room and they've got a kind of chain mail thing that they're holding and they walk to the walls as though, okay, if anybody is here and invisible, we will capture them. But then that's as far as they go. Like they, they surround Kemp and walk him and they're so out in the open. We see these huge open shots where yeah. just anybody could walk by. <laughs> yep. Yeah. They, they, they do not think about this at all. They've not thought it through. No. A B for effort though. <laughs> i mean a man's about to die <laughs> c for effort then <laughs> <sighs> okay so we do get kemp through this passageway we get him into a car we don't send anybody with him he's just right? free to drive himself so goodbye you're fine don't worry plan executed we're gonna stay behind capture this invisible man and kemp hears jack in the back seat okay but I think before he even hears him, he start he kind of brags out loud, like, yes, got away from you, man, like 10 o'clock my behind. Ha ha ha. Oops. Oops. <laughs> so we pull over, we tie him up, we put him back in the front seat so that we can drive to the edge of another cliff, because we love a fucking cliff in this movie. Mm. And 
Jack just sends him over and we have to watch this car do about three dozen 360 degree flips <laughs> and then explode at the bottom of this cliff. So again, I, I did not expect this, but he also like no. before he pushes him down, he narrates what's going to happen to him once mm-hmm. the car goes down the cliff. <laughs> Let me give you a glimpse of what I'm about to do to you. So mean, so cruel, so unnecessary. Just stick your dick in his face and be done with it. You don't need to go to all this pomp and circumstance. No, nah, man, he's a jilted lover. He ain't gonna do that shit. Truly, if I can't have you, it's a fiery death for you. Yeah, no. <laughs> But there's something funny about this. Like it this is, is and, and this is well even say, yeah, this is a darkly comedic death. Mm-hmm. But what makes it funny? Is it that Kemp is so pathetic here? Is it that we thought he was going to get away? He was so cocky. Like what, what makes this funny? Other than the fact that we're watching a very cruel person kill someone. Yeah. Is it funny or is it darkly funny? Like the fact that we thought we got away with it and then he's so easily foiled, captured, killed. I think it's almost too like the punctuation of the explosion. I I think I actually just went, oh, yeah, (laughs) when it actually happens. I did too. And I, I think you're right. It's also this subversion where I will truthfully confess, I knew their plan was not going to work, but I didn't think Kemp was going to die. Yeah. Mm hmm. And and again, if you've read the book, he doesn't die in the book. So this is mm. like one of those rare like adaptation changes that I think really works. Yeah. Well, and this movie has such a mean streak. This is very much in keeping with what we've seen before. Mm-hmm. It's just that it's never happened to a character we truly knew or liked. The closest is Jaffer. And right. I mean, eh, it's yeah, no, this is I mean, well, and th- but that's the thing, though. I mean, like. The real quote unquote characters in this film are Jack, Mm -hmm. Kemp, yeah, the end of list, and everyone else is a side character. I was gonna say dot dot dot. (laughs) (laughs) No, because everyone else is basically a side character. So the ones that are side characters that are meant to be like real characters don't have that effect. Mm -hmm. But because Whale was so interested and more interested in those side characters, they leap off the screen more than Flora and her father do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have weird, interesting, little quirky things to do to the point where at the end of the movie where we have some random police officer go to Flora and say, can you come and see him in the hospital? He's about to die. I'd forgotten she was in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. She has like three or four scenes. Mm -hmm. She's not in this movie for large swatches of time. Yeah. And yeah, she has like second or third billing. Well, I I mean, she's the name, right? Yeah, that's the star. Yeah, that, that yeah. studio system. Yeah. Okay, so Kemp is dead, and the weather is turning. It's starting to snow, so Jack seeks shelter in a nearby barn, and this is when a farmer notices that he's breathing. And this effect is so simplistic. It's mm-hmm. just, <laughs> we're pushing a hay bale up and down, and it's delightful. It totally works for me. It, but it's also kind of silly in a way. But, but it, it is. But it doesn't pull you out of it. It's just like, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And even this farmer really makes an impression when he goes into the police and says, you know, oh, there's somebody breathing in my barn, breathing in the hay. Well, and in case you didn't know, Joe, this movie's going to end in like five minutes. Honestly, we we are done. We're basically already done. <laughs> Kemp's death is, in certain regards, the emotional climax of the movie. Yeah. Right? Not with any woman in this movie. <laughs> no, no. Although I, I would argue other people might feel differently because they find the ending more conventionally appropriate. Whereas you and I are like, hmm, I see what you're doing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But okay, so what is their plan once they know the barn? He's in the barn. Okay, so we know he's in the barn, so we surround it. What we're going to do, we're going to flush him out. And we're going to use the snow on the ground to identify where he is. And we will simply shoot him when we see the footprints. Okay. So do you want to know how they did the footprints in the snow? Uh, Was it more wire work? No, that wouldn't have worked. Oh, they were under it. So here's the thing. (sighs) Oh. They dug a trench along the line where they wanted the footprints. And they covered the trench with a board in which footprint-shaped holes had been cut. Oh, the footprint openings were filled with like what they cut out to like keep mm-hmm. it up, and then they put the snow on top of it, and then they basically went and they and one by one they pulled the the foot shaped wood piece out, which would then have the snow drop through the hole they had made. Right. Wow. 
I know. That is a lot of extra effort. It, to dig a trench. I mean, again, they have men standing in this trench. So what? You got at least a six foot hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you fuck it up, I guess, well, maybe it's not super hard to reset because you just pack well, the snow back in. Uh, yeah, because the only thing is you'd have to like re-snow over it to make it look like fresh snow. But I imagine yeah. they just use fake snow for that. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is not yeah. real snow by any stretch. Yeah, exactly. But it looks great. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it looks real. <laughs> mm-hmm. As as you well now know, because you live in an area where you actually get real snow. So you can tell the difference on screen now. My God, Joe, there's literally a blizzard outside my apartment right now. I don't, even. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we're recording this. I don't know how I have internet. <laughs> the good news is, is that an invisible man is not going to be able to sneak up on you because you'll see him coming. That is very true. I'm trying to find some silver linings for you. It's fine. I'm, I, I, I'll start a... No, I don't have a... Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. It's fine. You'll start a fire. Jenny Hall will serve you food. It'll be great. Oh, my God. Honestly, like, Una O'Connor, like, is the MVP of this movie for me. But, you know, for it's sure. fine. She's hilarious. Yeah. She's long gone at this point. She's already collected her paycheck, and she's on to another movie. Very much so. <laughs> she's actually on to Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> right, yeah. She's in pre, pre-production. Yeah. <sighs> Okay, so, yeah, we see footprints in the snow, we shoot a couple times, body falls down, all looks good. So then we recruit Flora and Dr. Cranley to come and say goodbye because Jack is in the hospital. I'm not quite sure how this doctor knows that this is going to happen, but we hypothesize that he will begin turning visible again as his body begins to shut down because presumably the serum is uh, i don't know question mark science no no no. because you know how like when you die your body evacuates your bowels maybe maybe they were like going by that train of thought where it was like okay like it's gonna evacuate the toxins in his body too which would be this indian flower (laughs) yeah or we just pull off his skin and then we don't have the serum in him anymore (laughs) Yeah, that, that that works too. But nevertheless, though, his reappearance, mm-hmm. I, I forgot that we see the skull first. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just basically a reverse dissolve. Mm-hmm. And it's, I probably think, one of the least complicated FX shots in the movie. But it looks great. And it's really fun because you realize, oh, fuck, Claude Rains has developed a truly memorable character using only his voice and his body movements. And then we finally get to see his face as the movie ends. It's great. I I think this is why he became so famous because yeah, I mean, how many actors can say, yeah, my breakout role was one in which you don't see me except for a five second shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's, you know, I'm I'm not going to say he's the most handsome man I've ever seen in a thirties film, but Mm. you know, it is extremely memorable to be that face that the movie then goes to credits on. So it's a good way to end the movie if you're an actor looking to break out. Yeah, he was giving me um, David Desmolchen vibes, actually, when he appeared. Like, that's what he looked like to me. Like a oh. 1930s David Desmolchen. What? God damn it. <laughs> I'm never going to get his name right. But you know what I'm talking about. Desmolchen. Desmolchen. Des- there we go. Fuck. Yeah. You know, A for effort. B for effort. <laughs> <laughs> over effort <laughs> f for fail <laughs> okay so i mentioned uh Legowski as a reference and this is where i'm going to bring in something that kind of summarizes the queerness in the movie now that the film is over so he says one can metaphorically read society's invisible man as its homosexual man effeminate dangerous when naked seeking a male partner in Ooh. quotation mark crime tending to idolize his fiancée rather than love her, and becoming visible only when shot by the police, monitored by doctors, and heard regretting his sin against God, i.e. made into a statistic by the three primary forces oppressing queers, the law, the medical establishment, and religious orthodoxy. Uh, see, I can buy into that. I think that's a really easy read to, 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 to agree with right yeah it it's one of those things where i think when you're watching the movie it doesn't seem inherently queer it has a touch of that james whale camp it's got this really iconic vocal performance we're doing some really cool effects and then when you end the film and you start to think back it's like okay what are we saying about the invisible man it's not just that he uses his power to become super powerful and it goes to his head and so on but also, he is what we as a society don't want to acknowledge. He's the invisible part of ourselves. 
and what is less visible than queers in the 1930s. Well, okay, but then if we want to read him as queer, then what does that say that we're watching a queer man drunk with power who is wanting to take over the world? I mean, this is an easy one for me where I just think, oh, well, when you don't recognize queer people as people, Mm. when we get the opportunity to take revenge on you, we will fucking murder you. Yeah, we will. We'll fucking derail that train. We'll strap you to a car and tell you how you're going to die and then kill you. Um, I mean, not really, like not literally, but I like the idea. You know, we we like to celebrate women reclaiming their power and having agency. And I think this is just the same version of that only for, in this case, what I'm reading as a gay man, where... It's a bit of queer rage. Yeah. No, I, I 100% agree. Can totally buy into that. And you know what? It's cathartic. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and then we kill him off so nobody has to be deeply concerned. Yeah. And, you know, and then we got the code a uh, year after this. <laughs> <laughs> I think these queers are getting a little angry. I think we might need to, like, tramp down on some of that. God, yeah. When does that Catholic Legion of Decency come around? I'm sure that's around the same oh, time, God. too. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, that is The Invisible Man. Um, Joe, so final, because I, I know we talked about how you know, this is a very short film, but does mm-hmm. it feel like a complete film to you by the time the credits roll? <sighs> yeah. I think some of the set pieces are really amazing. The missing links are in these relationships. Like, I would have taken more time between Jack and Kemp. Mm-hmm. I think if we have to include Flora in here, we need something more so that even when she comes back at the end, I shouldn't feel so ambivalent about whether she gets to say goodbye. I also just don't buy it when he ends up apologizing to her. It feels like we're supposed to have these huge emotional stakes in their reunion. And I don't care. Yeah, I mean, again, that's the thing. We're supposed to believe that he's only mad because of the monocane and that in his death, he is like becoming more sane as it happens. So it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. I mean, you still Mm -hmm. did all this stuff. (laughs) Yeah, even I think the... I like how speedy the timeline is because it feels like once he gets found out, it just all spirals and goes to shit. But the timing is a little bit too fast and loose. You know, I could have taken a bit more of the manhunt, stretch this out and give us a better sense of, okay, what was his plan? Like, was he really going to talk to politicians and so on? Like the scripting here to me is just the weak part. And then if we would have had a few more minutes to watch it play out, I think all of these human interactions would just be more satisfying. No, I I completely agree with you. And even though, I mean, truthfully, this is my favorite universal monster movie, but I don't disagree with you about the script issues, but I think it's a thing, you know, where it's like the effects were so impressive. Yeah. Um, it is a highly entertaining film, even though, yeah, mm. plot-wise, it doesn't. It feels like there are missing pieces here. Yeah. Um, but it's a good time. That's it, right? It's such a good time. I'm willing to forgive it for all of these flaws. Not even that many flaws. For me, this is a four out of five star mm-hmm. film. It just could have been so much better if we could have let it sit let it hit you know even the ramifications of him derailing that train this would be huge give me even a funeral sequence so we could see people lamenting oh my god we are under the throes of this madman who is invisible he could be anywhere the paranoia i think even could have been amped up a little bit more well, and, like, again, the runtime isn't, like, new for these films. You know, Dracula no. is 75 minutes. Frankenstein is seven is the same length as this movie. Um, yeah, it's not the decision of these films. This is how these films were made so that we could put them into an A picture, B picture. So the movie never would have been longer. It was always going to be just above 70 minutes. Yeah, but it's more about, okay, well, can we sacrifice one of these rampages for a character base scene, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Or no, I get it. maybe remove a character so that everybody just gets a bit more. Well, again, hearing how the like, whale and sheriff wanted to be like, no, I want the heroine to have no one when the film ends. I mm-hmm. feel like that's the only reason she's in this movie is so that they could do that with the ending. Yeah. And I will say it is satisfying, even though the film doesn't hammer home that, oh, it's kind of tragic how she doesn't have anyone now. It just kind of ends as, oh, look at this sad, unrequited love. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that works. If we really wanted to go with that as the film's final message, oh, it's so sad. She's by herself. I needed you to hammer that home a little harder. 
Yeah, I I think it was at the end of the day, it was a footnote of a joke that Whale was having. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be funny? Ha ha. <laughs> With heterosexuals? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, you <sighs> thought she was gonna find love? No, she's a spinster now. <laughs> She's an old hag. She's like 23 years old. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> you know, already over the hill, not ripe. 23. 23 and me, 23 and single. You're a spinster, old lady. Uh, well, okay, everyone. Well, before we announce what we're covering next week, uh, just some quick housekeeping to get out of the way. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at HorrorQueers. Shoot us an email at HorrorQueers at gmail.com. Find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. And if you want to chat with other listeners, please join our Facebook Horror Queers group and talk to them. If you have a moment, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if you want even more content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. If you subscribe today, you will get 295 and a half hours of Patreon Ooh. content, including this month's new episodes on Hannibal Season 1, Episode 3. Imaginary, Immaculate, Love Lies Bleeding, and our audio commentary on Rennie Harlan's super dumb and super fun, Mindhunters. Indeed. And Trace, even though I know no one ever listens past the point where you say, and now a little bit of housekeeping, uh, I did just want to make a recommendation because I realized I forgot to say it. But if yeah. you enjoy Invisible People films, there's a really underrated Canadian movie called The Unseen from 2016. It's just really underrated and i would strongly recommend it because the special effects are gangbusters and it's got a really strong like familial emotional family core i've never heard of this but even just looking at the poster which is his mm-hmm. him with this half invisible face but with his like, yeah. jaw showing is really it's very good <laughs> yeah yeah oh. big recommend 100 percent of rotten tomatoes based on nine reviews mm-hmm all right. All right. Well, um, okay. Well, well uh, Joe, uh, shit, we can't even close that yet. What are we talking about next week? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for episode 276, as we creep towards 300, we're also starting a new month. So uh, let's celebrate a certain film's early anniversary, Trace. So even though it doesn't turn 25 until December, mm-hmm. let's coincide with the release of Ripley on Netflix and talk about the talented mr ripley Ooh, i've only seen this once and it was a college watch and i remember none of it okay i remember thinking that it's by the guy who does the english patient and that i should be impressed oh okay 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 well you know what um i'm excited because i know it's a good movie it is. It's a long one. So everybody oh. strap in. <laughs> 70 minutes to two plus hours. <laughs> there we go. The gamut. All right, everyone. Well, until next time, we can cross out the Invisible Man original flavor. <laughs> uh, I think that would be H.G. Wells. But yes, we can cross <laughs> out horror queers. <laughs>